It's my pleasure to meet with you briefly today to talk about the sense of smell or olfaction, which is our most evocative sense. Uh, this occasion is thanks to the fact that the Loft Theater is showing this lovely little French film called Les Parfums or The Perfume. And uh, the story is really engaging, I think. Uh, but what's really remarkable to me is how much of the science and the art of creating scents uh, that are uh, detectable by our olfactory system and of interest to humans uh, is portrayed properly and accurately in this film. And my job now is to help you understand a little bit more about how the olfactory system works and, and to help complement what's presented in the film to perhaps enhance your enjoyment of the film. Now, I start with this slide uh, just to show something about the nature of the stimuli that our olfactory system contends with. This is an old slide, but it's really revealing. Uh, if you sniff the scent of these foodstuffs, each of them in, in turn, uh, you're drawing into your uh, olfactory, uh, your airway, your olfactory system, uh, chemical compounds that are called volatile organic chemicals that are present uh, or emitted by these foodstuffs. And as you draw the air in, uh, you bring in those compounds and the mixtures that are typical of what's present in and released by these foods. So for example, a, a cut apple, uh, you know, it has a characteristic scent, but what you're actually dealing with is a mixture of more than 350 identified volatile organic compounds in a more or less characteristic mixture. Uh, my favorite example is coffee. Uh, I love the scent of brewed coffee. Uh, and that's very complex. It has nearly 800 at this time, the time of this uh, slide was made, uh, nearly 800 uh, identified or get volatile organic chemicals. <clears throat> and, you know, we can tell a great deal about the coffee by just sin sniffing it. We can tell if it's been on the hot plate too long and is burned. We can tell if it's a dark roast or a light roast or instant coffee. Uh, we, we just can tell a great deal by a single sniff. And, and what we're doing is assessing this very complex mixture and the way it varies with different conditions of the coffee. That's a monumental task for an analytical organic chemist and our, our uh, olfactory system does it very quickly and very powerfully. So one of my messages right away is don't believe the old saw that dates back to the 19th century, that human olfaction is weak and not very impressive. It's actually very impressive and not weak at all. Uh, and uh, it's only in comparison with dogs and bears and other really olfactorily empowered creatures that we look weak. Uh, we do a pretty good job with our olfactory system. And it brings us a great deal of pleasure, which is somehow really uh, relevant to the film. Now, the film is about making perfumes. And the key, um, one of the two key actors, the, the female actress, whose uh, screen name is Mademoiselle Valbert, she is what's called in the business a nose. That's an, a term of art for the people in the fragrance industry uh, who have learned through a great deal of practice and, and experience to make very fine discriminatory choices among uh, scent compounds in, in making mixtures that have particularly appealing or effective uh, characteristics. But the problem is olfactory stimulants, we call them odorants, uh, can only be described sort of by analogy. Consider the difference between olfaction or sense and vision uh, or seeing. Uh, in the case of vision, we have words that really describe the physical stimulus that we're trying to uh, describe. So long wavelength of light, uh, which is a physical property of the stimulus, we call that red. <clears throat> we all agree pretty much that it's red if we're not colorblind. 
uh, a short wavelength we call blue. And, and we all agree if we're not colorblind and so forth. But with scent, we can only describe the, the uh, impression of the stimulus by analogy or by comparison with, with uh, uh, objects or uh, sent sources in the in our lived experience that people share. So uh, we all can pretty much agree on uh, ordinarily uh, in, in uh, on scents that are what's called citrusy. Uh, including citrus fruits, but also could be other things uh, th that have a citrusy note to them, or green, which is sort of the scent of cut grass. Uh, very different kinds of chemical compounds share these properties. And we can only say, well, this is in the category of green compound. This is in the category of spicy compound and so forth. Now, there's a lot more to learn about this. Uh, and there are good websites. All you have to do is use your browser and look for perfume or creating a perfume. Uh, these are a couple that I uh, yeah, I know you don't have time to write down, but uh, it's, there's good stuff out there. So I just commend it to you if you're interested. Now, what happens though, when we draw air into our nose? So here, here's the hole in the nose, the nares. We draw air in and it brings with it the scent compounds uh, that are present in whatever we're sniffing uh, into the nasal cavity. This cavity behind the nose. So here, looking at this example, here's a flower, there's a scent molecules coming off the flower. We draw air in to our nasal cavity uh, that brings with the air these volatile chemicals. Now, when they are in the nasal cavity and percolate around in here, they come into contact with a little patch of epithelium right here. Uh, that's different from the rest of the epithelium lining the cavity. Uh, this is called respiratory epithelium. And this little patch is called olfactory epithelium. It's very different. It has special cells that aren't present in the rest of the epithelium. One of the most important cell types, really the only one that's really essential for today is this cell type here. <laughs> this is called an olfactory receptor neuron. It has a process that extends down through the epithelium to the surface, that is right to the surface here, exposed to the air that is uh, drawn into the nasal cavity. And at that point, this process puts out little spaghetti-like processes that are called uh, uh, cilia. The cilia are really the, the one place where odor molecules have their effect. And I'll say more about that in just a second. Uh, the other thing is that this cell puts out another process that heads up through a bone here, holes in a bone up into the brain. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So what's special about the cilia is that they express in, in each receptor cell, that cell expresses one of about 400 olfactory receptor genes. Uh, what I mean by expressing it is that the, the, those genes express uh, uh, encode uh, information about making a particular protein, an olfactory receptor protein, that sh once the gene is expressed, that protein is inserted into these cilia, and that enables those cilia to bind certain odor molecules uh, for which the receptor protein is sort of tuned, and that determines the receptivity of this neuron to a bit of the olfactory world. Uh, and there are 400 roughly of those genes. So there are roughly 400 what we call phenotypes, that is 400 different tunings of olfactory receptor cells. Uh, and that's all the olfactory system can do with the odors is to, is to see what's the pattern of binding of, of odor stimuli to these cilia as reflected in the activity of a bunch of different olfactory receptor cells. So the, the challenge of the brain is to read the pattern of activity that's generated by an olfactory stimulus that all began down here in the cilia. By the way, the discovery of that gene family, which is one of the biggest gene families in the human genome, earned a, a Nobel Prize for Linda Buck and Richard Axel uh, 20 or so years ago, a uh, very important discovery. And it really opened up a huge opportunity for understanding more about the olfactory system. Okay, so that's the 
that's the input. I want to point out uh, one other interesting feature of these receptor cells. Not only are they the ones that detect odors out here that activates the cells depending on the binding of odor molecules to the receptor proteins, that information goes into the brain. But look, there's another important thing. These cells are exposed to the world because the outside world here is directly in contact uh, with the uh, nasal cavity, that is anything that's in the air, you sniff in, it comes in here. That can be smoke, it can be toxic chemicals, it can be viruses, it can be all kinds of bad things, in addition to the scent molecules that we're talking about. And these are the only nerve cells in the nervous system that are exposed directly to the outside world and project directly into the brain themselves. This is really important because it means that viruses, some viruses and, and, and toxic uh, substances have access to the brain through these innocent receptor cells. Uh, it's a really important consideration and I haven't got time to discuss further here. Now, there's the other thing I want to say that I wouldn't have said if we hadn't been going through the pandemic that we've experienced. That is this cell type here called supporting cells uh, turn out to be perhaps a target for the COVID-19 virus. As far as we can tell, the receptor cells themselves don't bind the the virus, but the supporting cells do. And as you know, one of the early symptoms of COVID-19 disease is loss of smell. That leads to the supposition or the theory that the binding of the virus to the supporting cells somehow interferes with the olfactory function. Uh, so stay tuned. We don't really fully understand that yet, as far as I know. Okay, well, another thing I want to point out before we get into a little more nuts and bolts is that drawing air into the nose so that the air gets up here into the nasal cavity is only one of two pathways to get stimulus molecules, volatile chemicals up into this cavity. The other way, the, the other way is through what's called the retronasal pathway. That is from the back of the throat uh, the back of the mouth of the throat here the, in the nasal pharynx. So here, when you uh, chew food or drink vo vol uh, drink uh, beverages, volatiles that are brought in and liberated by those uh, ingested things, uh, those volatiles can find their way through that retronasal pathway up into the nasal cavity. So now you've got two contributors to stimulation of the olfactory epithelium the stuff that comes through that pathway and the stuff that comes in through the nose. Uh, this is really important because when we talk about not liking the taste of a food or the taste of a beverage, we're not being precise. We should say we don't like the flavor because flavor is really a mixture of gustatory stimulation, which is what happens in the mouth and on the tongue. That's taste, true taste, and olfaction, which is through mostly in the case of flavor through the retronasal pathway. And that's overwhelmingly the important part of flavor, much more uh, prominent in, in discriminating different flavors than is uh, the, the gustatory taste. This is simply salty, bitter, sweet, and so forth. So uh, again, there's a lot to say about this and it's frustrating that I don't have time to say more. Okay, what happens now? We've got the olfactory epithelium stimulated up here through the activity of volatiles in the cilia. And here's another diagram that shows all these receptor cells being stimulated. Uh, and they send their axons up through the bone here, the cribriform plate. And what they do when they get into the olfactory bulb, this little finger-like thing that's lying right here on the other side of the bone. It's at the base of the brain in the rostral or front end of the brain. Uh, uh, what, what happens there is that th these processes, these axons converge in very large numbers onto little ball-shaped structures called glomeruli. That's this word here. That's a word that means ball of yarn. Uh, that, that convergence into the glomerulus is really important. Uh, because not only does that bring the, these processes in contact with central nerve cells in the bulb uh, where they make synaptic contacts and then according to the stimulation pattern of these receptor cells, they stimulate the central neurons. But the other really important thing is, remember each of these receptor cells expresses one of the receptor genes. And it turns out that 
that all of the receptor cells expressing a particular receptor gene converge on one of these glomeruli. So uh, I'm simplifying the, the, the true story, but uh, this is to a first approximation of the story. So that means that the glomeruli, these little ball shaped structures are like mailboxes that are receiving all the information coming in from the outside world uh, about a particular little part of the olfactory world, that which is encoded or, or detectable, I should say, by one of the olfactory receptor proteins expressed in, in particular, the cilia of particular receptor cells. I hope that's clear. So we've, we've now got the, the olfactory uh, bulb with partitioned structures that, <clears throat> that uh, ha have little windows on the olfactory world. And, <clears throat> and you can imagine that, that depending on the pattern of stimulation determined by these volatiles, you get different patterns of activation across the receptor cell population, different patterns of activation across these nerve fibers going into the bulb, and then consequently different patterns of activity in the glomeruli and received by the central neurons. All of that is really important to understand how olfaction works. Now, uh, what we've got so far is we've got a little patch of epithelium, the olfactory epithelium, it's about the size of a postage stamp. We've got millions of olfactory neurons in that patch of epithelium, and the number ranges, the estimates of the number ranges widely, and it uh, depends a lot on how they're making the estimate and also the condition of the person, the subject in, in question, and so forth. But there's a lot, let's just say there are millions, but they only represent 400 different receptor phenotypes, that is, these millions of cells, each of them is expressing only one of these 400 roughly olfactory receptor genes, uh, and therefore all, about 400 olfactory receptor proteins. Uh, and that determines the tuning, if you will, of these receptor cells. So you've got 400 different input channels, uh, and yet humans, it's now estimated, can, can discriminate probably detect and discriminate probably even up to a trillion odors. I mean, how could that possibly be the case? Well, here's a little example that will be hard to describe quickly, but I'll try. Uh, here, I've got just 14 of the 400 receptor phenotypes or odor receptors on, on receptor cells. And here we've got a bunch of volatile organic chemical stimuli, typical ones that we're all smelling all the time. Uh, so we could look at them individually or we could look at them as a mixture, which is what sense almost always that we encounter in our lives are almost always uh, mixtures. And first thing we can say is, well, for each of these compounds, what's our subjective impression of it? Well, this one here, this uh, it, it's it's an acid, an organic acid, and it's it tends to smell like sour or rancid. Uh, th this is uh, an alcohol here, and it's it smells sweet or, or woody or herbal, and so forth. So we can describe our subjective feelings about each of these odors if we sniff them as pure compounds. But what about the receptor cell activation patterns? So we have very big variation. Don't forget, it's all about whether these little mo stimulus molecules can bind to any of these receptor proteins, uh, because if, if it can bind strongly, it'll activate the receptor cell strongly. If it can only bind weakly, it, re it stimulates the receptor cell weakly, uh, and so forth. So there are many gradations of effectiveness. Now, let's say in this example of 14 receptor phenotypes, this acid only stimulates one of them. It binds to the receptor protein in this cell type, it activates the cell, but none of the others bind that odor. And so none of the other um, receptor cells represented by these receptor proteins is activated. On the other hand, here's a compound that stimulates a whole bunch of these, or it binds to a whole bunch of these receptor proteins and therefore can stimulate a whole bunch of receptor cells. So I hope it's clear that you get different patterns of activation of the input into the olfactory bulb 
uh, with different odor stimuli, that's very varies not only with the identity of this compound, but also the concentration of it in the incoming air. So you've got multi-dimensional variability. And then it gets more complicated when you've got a mixture. So then in fact, what we're dealing with is what's called the combinatorial coding mechanism. Uh, you can get billions of discriminations out of a finite number of uh, or trillions, a finite number of receptor input channels just because of the fact that you could have such variable patterns or you, uh, in a way you could think fingerprint of activity evoked by each of these compounds and then still other patterns by mixtures. And that's what our olfactory system is able to do. So uh, able to make a combinatorial code for a stimulus uh, no matter how complex the stimulus is, and then the brain reads that and, and does it quite powerfully. Okay, where does the information go? So we've stimulated the receptor cells of the receptor epithelium. They've sent information through their axons up here into the olfactory bulb. In the olfactory bulb, within the glomeruli, they make synaptic connections with, with central neurons, which when activated, then carry information, elect patterns of electrical activity into higher order centers in the brain. Now, where do they, what are those centers that receive this input? Well, this is now where it gets really interesting and quite relevant to the movie because the olfactory system has very privileged and powerful input to what's called the limbic system in the brain. This uh, is a number of different structures that are shown in this slide. Uh, the piriform cortex, for example, which is otherwise often called the olfactory cortex, the amygdaloid complex, it begins with the amygdala here, and that's uh, this structure, uh, the, the hippocampus, which is uh, this big thing here that uh, in this color here, that uh, is so named because it looks a bit like a seahorse. Anyway, together, these all make up the limbic system and some other structures I haven't even listed. And why is that so interesting? Well, it's because this is where emotion, feelings, uh, emotionally laden memories and so forth are all uh, processed and encoded and retained uh, in, in, the, in the brain. Uh, and no other primary sense, not vision, not hearing, not um, taste, not touch, uh, has the same kind of direct powerful input to the limbic system that, that olfaction has. And this is reflected in an experience that most of us have had. Uh, I mean, I'd be surprised if you haven't walked into a, a house, for example, and smelled bread baking and it didn't immediately have an emotional memory of your mother or your grandfather or grandmother, or uh, maybe your grandfather if, if he baked. Uh, or for example, in my case, uh, you know, there, there were, my father smoked, smoked a pipe all the time. And when I, when I smell pipe smoke, uh, I think of my father and, and I can see him uh, with his pipe and on and on it goes. I mean, we almost everybody, if they have a functioning olfactory system has this experience, not only of deja smelled, but that it means something emotional to you. That's thanks to this privileged access to the limbic system. Uh, and this is in part what a perfumer or a fragrance scientist is trying to do, is to try to make uh, scents that are pleasant to a wide variety of people, if even attractive, and also evocative, uh, reminiscent of, of other scent experiences that they might have had. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's quite a challenge. I might mention in passing that these scientists, these, these professionals, not only make perfumes, but they're responsible for the scent that we have in soap and detergents, um, even little sneaky things that you might not be aware of. Uh, there's quite an industry of providing scent in shopping centers and in stores, uh, a background scent that you might not even be conscious of, but which research has shown motivates people to buy. And it's what's what I find really fascinating is that not only that use of scent, but even in detergents, for example, some main label detergent, if you actually analyze the scent of it, it'll be different in the southeast of the country than it is in the northwest, just as an example. And that's because the industry has found through research that different parts of the country with different 
population profiles are motivated more or less by a particular sense to do the shopping or use the product. Um, and therefore, sense is being used in a, in a really subtle and clever way to motivate people in certain ways. And we might not be even conscious of it. Not to mention the importance of scent for interpersonal interactions. Um, what mother doesn't love the scent of her baby's hair? Uh, or what, what one among us doesn't love the scent of our loved ones? So this is all wonderful stuff about olfaction, and I could go on for a whole year talking about it, but I hope this has been interesting to you. And I want to stress at the end, that uh, yeah, flowers are great and and all that, but the real the real joy for me comes from the scent of a good glass of wine. And so, let's celebrate that. And I hope the movie uh, will have been really interesting to you. And I hope this little discourse will have helped you appreciate it. Thank you for your attention.